Good morning and welcome to another session by the Global Farmer Network. Today's session is focused on water management, and this is the first of our two-part series of webinars about water. Be sure to join us on March 28. Before we start, let me tell you something about the Global Farmer Network. We were established in the year 2000 by farmers, and it's still led by farmers. Our focus is to connect, empower, and mobilize farmers worldwide. We believe in the power of knowledge transfer, which is why we created this webinar series and offer multiple approaches that focus on action, collaboration, and results that showcase agriculture as part of the solution to the main challenges facing humanity. Our membership is formed by 216 individual male and female farmer leaders from 65 countries with farms of all types and sizes. Our mission is to amplify the farmer's voice in promoting trade, technology, sustainable farming, economic growth, and food security. We invite you to follow us on our social media channels. Today's speakers are also members of the Global Farmer Network. We will start with Aaron Moore, who is Australian but living in the UAE in the Middle East. And Aaron, um, tell us about yourself, please. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, my slides will dive into it a little bit, but um, yeah, as Gina mentioned, I'm originally from Australia, um, sort of grown up, you know, surrounded by the agricultural industry, uh, being fortunate to, it's allowed me to sort of travel um, overseas. So I'm now currently based in Dubai in the UAE. Um, and yeah, sort of, we'll go into a little bit of detail of uh, the journey and how water sort of plays a pretty uh, key part in my agricultural journey, definitely. Thank you, Aaron. I know that you have worked in your home level in Australia and also in New Zealand with a machinery company. And then you went into how technology and innovation can enhance sustainable agricultural practices. With this, you moved to Vietnam, where he, you began your education in all things hydroponics and scratched the surface of indoor farming practices. Then you found yourself moving abroad and this time le growing leafy greens in the middle of the desert, which is why we invited you to share so, so more about your work. And now you're transitioning to our latest challenge, working with greenhouses in an effort to find more cost-effective ways to bring food to the people of the UAE. So Aaron, thank you so much for being here. The stage, the stage is yours. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, thank you for everyone joining, wherever you may be listening from. Um, so to sort of go, I guess, where my journey in agriculture began, I was born in a town called Moree in Australia. It's quite a small town. Um, I consider myself very lucky that I was able to grow up sort of surrounded by agriculture. Um, my dad actually works for an agricultural company as CFO um, and their main product um, growing up, a lot of it was broad acre crops in particular, what you see in the picture here, um, which is cotton. So um, this is a very common site in the town that I'm from, especially you know this time of year as we're approaching. Uh, this would be sort of, you would see all throughout and surrounding the town. Um, Mori is a major agricultural centre um, in Australia, and it's it's really renowned for its uh, cotton production in particular, which is um, where water is very very key. Um, Mori is also known for being home to some artesian hot springs, so you know the natural asset in the form of water is is very intertwined uh, into the town's identity and, and history. So. Uh, yeah, so, you know, despite having these natural assets, um, farming in Australia is certainly without, not without its fair share of challenges. Um, from a very young age, growing up in Australia, it's, it's extremely common to experience long periods of drought. Um, you know, in, even in my short lifetime, there's, there's been several years of prolonged drought. Um, even people, that, you know, that have no connection to agriculture in Australia, will have, living in major cities, will have even been aware of or experience, you know, water restrictions in the form of, um, you know, you can only water your garden one day a week during this particular hour in certain neighborhoods or the communities being asked to reduce 
you know, even how long they're, they're taking a shower for to try and help uh, in the efforts during, you know, severe drought uh, in Australia. On the opposite end of the spectrum, it's, it's almost just as common uh, to experience really extreme or severe flooding. Um, and they kind of go, they kind of flip back and forth between drought to flooding. Um, so yeah, we're a nation of extreme weather conditions. Um, and all of these experiences lead you to really have a deep, you know, sense of uh, the importance and also the value of water. Um, and especially if growing in the agricultural industry, you really, um, you know, value um, value water really dearly. Um, and it's certainly something that has shaped in a lot of ways my journey in agriculture. Um, it sort of has played a pivotal role uh, throughout my entire agricultural journey, um, especially in terms of like sustainability centered around uh, water. So this picture here, uh, so my first, I guess one of my first jobs within the agricultural industry uh, was in co cotton irrigation. So uh, it's very similar to the picture here. Basically you find yourself walking along the, the bank, starting siphons for as much as, you know, 12 plus hours per day. Um, and basically, yeah, other than trying to avoid brown snakes, um, you really do learn how to manage, uh, you know, and how complex the water systems within a, a farming operation can be. Um, and also the importance of operating it effectively um, during this time, you know, it gave me a very fundamental knowledge and understanding, um, not only of the value, but how to measure it. And in terms of like effectiveness, whether that be uh, measuring yield versus consumption or all the different factors that play a part um, yeah, next, a little bit different. Um, so as mentioned, I found myself, uh, fortunate enough to move to Vietnam. Um, I would say Vietnamese people, uh, from my experience, have a very different relationship with water than those, in, um, in Australia. Um, it's potentially not treated, uh, with, I guess, such value, but, um, once you maybe experienced a Vietnamese rainy season, that may may explain that a little bit in terms of, you know, just how how abundant the water does in fact feel in Vietnam. You know, it's very common to to see, um, you know, during the rainy season, it's extreme flooding just about everywhere. Um, even high tide can set off a flood in um, in the city in Ho Chi Minh. Um, but yeah, very common to see a lot of greenery, sprawling hills, row and row and row after uh, one another of rice uh, in fields um, using flood irrigation techniques. Very, very common. Um, however, in, in saying that, at the same time, you know, uh, you may see all these sprawling rivers, you know, they're a big part of the cities, they're moving in between the cities. You know, you've got the Mekong Delta in Vietnam where, you know, the the markets have even found their way onto the water themselves. Um, but despite all of that, um, you know, due to some mismanagement and some maybe potentially some lack of education and some unforeseen pressures, like things like um, China building dams up the river, up the Mekong, affecting um, the waterways, drought and salt water intrusion in the rivers are putting a lot of pressure on Vietnam agriculture. And we were starting to see that very much so in my time there, um, you know, that the high levels of water use, the water not pushing out to the ocean, what you're starting to see is you're actually starting to see that salt water creep up the rivers. You know, it's killing native plants, kills seaweed. It's also, you know, it affects like the fishing industry, um, also makes water much harder for the farmers that rely on that water in the river, whether it be for their livestock or crops. So, um, yeah, despite all that excessive amount of uh, water, it definitely was starting to create an impact uh, in Vietnam. Next slide. So yeah, that's sort of what brought me in a lot of ways to hydroponic farming. Um, so I'd only really seen a little bit of hydroponic farming um, throughout my time in Australia and, and some in um, New Zealand, but moving to Vietnam, uh, 
both myself and I've noticed that Vietnamese people have heavily adapted this type of agriculture. Um, it's available in a variety of different forms, which I'll touch on a little bit, but in simple terms, basically what you're doing is you're just applying nutrient rich water directly to the roots of the plant. So, um, you know, often mitigating or eliminating completely the, the need for soil. So in some areas, this is you know, extremely valuable practice um, when utilized correctly and done properly you know you can reduce the consumption rate of water by you know as much as 90 percent um, in some instances and even higher which i'll talk about a little bit further but yeah some of the different types of uh, methods of hydroponic farming um, i won't go into too much detail on each but basically these are sort of six of the more common practices um, You'll see nutrient film technique. Basically, you've got a substrate, which could be uh, like a rock wool or a sponge or coca peat, um, even soil itself. Basically, you have continuous moving water. The water is touching the roots or the base of the, the substrate to allow the nutrient to reach the plants. You'll have a drain on one end and then this, uh, the nutrient water being pumped on the other end. Pretty simple. Uh, deep water culture. Um, basically, you, you've got the plants and the roots sitting directly in the nutrient rich water constantly. Um, it's really important in this situation to have similar it, here. It mentions like an air pump, um, basically to ensure that you still have enough oxygenation reaching the, the, the plant. Otherwise it, it, it will have um, major effects. Uh, wick system. This could be like having a cotton strip or something that bringing the water from the nutrient solution to the, the plants themselves, um, ebb and flow. Is basically just a flood and drain system um, so basically you'll you'll fill where the the plants are over a period of time and then that that will drain drip system very common um, and applied pretty heavily uh, especially in the greenhouse industry um, and then aeroponics is basically misting the bottom of the root so com, com, this is even shown uh, high levels of reduction in water consumption um, the only challenge with using aeroponics can be that if for whatever reason you were to lose power, then you potentially are running a great risk of the plants not having any ability to, to gain any water or, or reach any of the nutrient, uh, which, which really you don't experience in the other, other systems as heavily. Um, and one that's not on here, but I did see a lot of um, in Vietnam is aquaponics. Um, so basically you're combining, you know, some methods of uh, you know recirculating aquaculture within the hydroponic method. Basically, the the fish within the bottom of the tank, for instance, would be providing nutrients to the plant, and the plants will be helping purify the water for the fish. So it's it's basically uh, a circular system. Uh, next, one thing that I touched on a little bit during my time in Vietnam was uh, working with shipping container farms. So basically, this would be considered in a lot of ways like a three-level version of indoor vertical farming. Um, it's a very modular design, uh, a little bit more affordable in some instances. But basically, you're building upon the, the foundation of hydroponic farming. Um, in the particular system I used, it, it basically had cotton strip that ran down the back of the plants and then drip irrigation feeding onto that cotton strip um, with the nutrient rich water that water would then reach the base of the roots uh, via the cotton cotton strip um, so you can start to incorporate more technologies with indoor vertical farming obviously you're able to control the complete climate within the room so you're able to you know capture some of that humidity um, reduce it where necessary you can be a little bit more there's less evaporation, things like that. You, you can control the temperature. Um, also, uh, in the system I had in the container farm, AC, obviously, as it's working, it's it creates condensate, same as your, your home AC would. Um, and basically, you can capture that that condensate, put it through a filter, and then if, if necessary, you can reuse that water as well, which is great. Um, some of the added technology as well, which I won't go into too much detail about, but you know, you're starting to incorporate LED grow lights, um, very uh, tailored nutrient dosing systems, um, and, and starting to incorporate a lot of data and analytics as well. 
Uh, and then this next slide, uh, this isn't actually a real photo that this is doctored for sure, but basically um, now I'm based in the UAE. Um, so living in Dubai, but farming just outside of Dubai. Um, UAE is a country known obviously for this picture here. It's, it's vast deserts and extremely scorching summers. Uh, temperatures reaching as high as 50 degrees uh, throughout the summertime. There's a lack of arable land. Um, you know, there's no soil. It's all sand predominantly. Very limited access to water. Minimal rainfall um, as low as 150 or 140 millimetres per year. Um, and even despite, you know, extensive efforts from the government with uh, things like cloud seeding, uh, funnily enough, it's forecasted to rain the next four days, which is almost unheard of here. Um, but they are investing very heavily in, in cloud seeding to, to boost what little rain there is in this region. Um, what that means, because there is no water, like natural water resources, they did do have some uh, bore water, et cetera. But uh, when they tried to move into some livestock agriculture, because there is a bit of a tradition of that here, more with like goat herding and camels. They nearly wiped out their entire water supply within only a few years. So they've started, they pulled back on that and they've started to invest overseas in a number of countries and then also looking at ways to be more efficient with the water that they do have. Um, but predominantly all the water that we would drink here or use at the farms is comes from the form of desalinated water. So they have a large desalination plant um, which is, you know, not a, a cheap endeavor, but something that's necessary for here. Um, it's also important to note that almost 85 to 90 percent of all food in the UAE is imported. So the agricultural industry here is is very immature, starting to grow quite rapidly, um, and you know, COVID further amplified the reliance on uh, innovation in this region and the lack of food security. Uh, in this region um, and why that's I mean really important is this is the other end of the spectrum when we talk about UAE um, and what most people sort of recognize or think of as well you know there is a huge population and a booming population in this region uh, it's growing extremely quickly um, and at a, at a very fast pace and the UAE and that have dedicated to a mission of becoming a global leader in food production um, by 2051. So they, they actually want to be one of the leading nations in the world when it comes to food security and food production. So they have a long, long way to go to get there, but they're, they are starting to make some significant strides in that area um, in order to achieve that. So uh, one such step would be the company that the reason I moved to the UAE and to Dubai was um, this project here. Uh, it's a farm called Bustanka, um, originally Emirates Crop One, now full by Emirates, uh, Emirates Fly Catering. Uh, this is the largest indoor vertical farm in the world. Uh, so it basically looks like a giant shopping mall, but inside basically it sits on a 10,000 square meter or a one hectare footprint. Um, inside it's actually three stories so you have about 30,000 square meters or three hectares of operational area um, but even more so it, it actually has racking and shelving so in theory there's actually 18 layers throughout the facility um, what that means is when you combine the ability to grow 365 days a year the rotation of crops as soon as plants are finished um, they're also doing multi-harvest or recuts. So basically do a first harvest, uh, they, it regrows at a, a quicker rate, second harvest regrows at a quicker rate, third harvest, then pull those plants out and we can re-transplant new plants in almost immediately within less than a week. So there's very minimal to no downtime in the growing process. Um, and what that means is from that 10,000 square meters or that one hectare footprint, you're able to produce the equivalent of, of close to 52 or over 50 hectares of uh, traditional outdoor agriculture. So pretty significant production capability. Um, this particular facility that I was working at we, is capable of producing about three tonnes per day of leafy greens. So lettuce, spinach, kale, 
um, and some microgreens. So that's three tons every day, 365 days a year. So although when you look at the entire population of the UAE, it's only a small step, it's a pretty significant step. Um, and also for the industry, particularly indoor vertical farming, still relatively mature in many ways. Um, this is a huge, huge project that sort of um, one of the first of its kind in a lot of ways because it's actually focused on growing product, pro product and producing for the local market rather than uh, more like R&D or trying to actually sell the next facility um, for a company. This, this facility's only goal is to be its own commercial business that provides food to the consumers. Uh, so this is a little snapshot of, you know, what it looks like inside the facility itself. This is um, basically within that 30,000 square meters of operational areas, 27, uh, what do we call modular grow rooms? So they're basically like individual farms. They can be completely tailored um, to that specific crops need, whether that be climate control, um, nutrient dosing, um, humidity, temperature, photo period how long the grow like the light the led grow lights are on or off um, so every little detail is tailored to the best possible growing environment for that specific crop um, in terms of water it's very unique in that the fact that any water that's not absorbed uh, by the plants is basically recycled within the system so there's absolutely no wastage um, within within the system itself Anything, and then further to that, um, which is very unique to this facility, is that uh, HVAC or the air conditioning system um, is actually able to suck out humidity from the room, which is important for the plant performance. But also uh, capturing that water per room per day works out to be about 3,000 litres per day per, per grow room. Um, that water can be sent to the RO treatment building uh, attached to the, the, uh, the site and basically be retreated and then reused within the grow room. So basically that, that allows even further water savings uh, within the facility. So we were able to, to state that we use about 95% less water to produce a kilo of lettuce. What that looks like is instead of using over 300 liters to produce one kilo, we were using around 15 to 17 liters um, per kilo. So pretty significant uh, saving. Uh, what else? Yeah, and even within the facility itself, any water, even after once it reached a point where it wasn't be utilized potentially within the growing room, um, that would be used for grey water, would be used for the external landscaping of the facility, or for actually uh, the bathrooms itself. So not no, almost next to no water was wasted within the building itself, which is huge. Um, yeah, and then I guess most recently, um, the current project I'm working with is a farming company called Tech Agro. Um, and this is a little bit different because we're focused on using greenhouse technology. Um, so being able to deliver high quality products year round, but the biggest difference uh, for this with a lot of other projects in the Middle East is being able to deliver it in a very cost effective measure. Um, the reason I decided to move and in this direction is I feel that although really incredible, the, the things that they're doing at Bustanica, I don't feel that that's an effective way to feed, you know, the entire population of the UAE or, or looking greater than that. Whereas the greenhouse technology, when, when utilized effectively, can be very cost effective. Um, it's, it's by no means um, a high capex or opex operation using polycarbon material um, and as well as some automated shading to reduce temperature within the greenhouse uh, and try to reduce evaporation. We have cooling pads at the back. Um, these are really important to obviously reduce the humidity. That condensate that's collected from those cooling pads can also be collected and, and reutilized within the farm as well. Uh, we do use drip irrigation, um, so using that directly to the roots of the plants this means, you know, reducing a lot of the risk of wastage um, and any potential runoff water as well. And then one unique thing that is proprietary to our company is we use a specific substrate, 
which when combined with uh, nanobubble technology does allow us to increase, obviously, dissolved oxygen at the root of the plant, um, but it also improves the efficiency and the uptake of the nutrient and the water itself, reducing how much we actually have to input into the plants. And it also is able to reduce the temperature at the root of the plant during the summer, which is a key key driver for us because the summer is a, is a really extreme challenge. Right now is incredible time of the year, um, peak production, but in the summertime, and it's important that we can deliver to customers year round, not just for you know six months of the year. But yeah, that's that's sort of uh, I guess my my journey within agriculture and and water itself. So hopefully, I learn a few things. Thank you, Aaron. Definitely learned a lot, and just this is just like a little scope of what producing in the middle of the desert can look like. But the innovations and solutions that you can bring to produce more food there is just astonishing. Thank you so much. We will come back to you with the Q&A. So we invite everyone to post your questions in the chat uh, sections, and we will move ahead to our new speaker. Hello, Amadou. Hello, Gina. Um, we're excited to have you here in this webinar about water. You have a lot of experience in establishment of greenhouses and irrigation systems, and you have been working with that for more than 15 years in West and Central Africa. You are also an advisor for agri-entrepreneurs in the development of business plans, establishment of greenhouses, irrigation systems, and commercial farms. You have also worked intensively with production of horticulture crops and several commercial farms in your country of Mali. You, aside from that job, have been coordinating and building and rehabilitating uh, buildings and historical monuments and also have been involved in urban planning and housing in your country. That's so amazing. And you're the owner of CTV Agrotechniques based in Bamako, Mali. Thank you so much and tell us about your story and I will share your presentation. Okay, thank you very much everybody. My name is Amadou Sidibe. I'm based in Mali and I'm a member of Global Farmer Network that's allowed me today to be with you. I will first of all apologize for my very poor English. I'm a French speaker, apologize and uh, beg you to try to listen to me to understand what else. some word will be in French, maybe thinking that it is in English. So um, as you say, Jenna, I'm an architect. I'm an architect and uh, uh, I've been working on architect a long time, more than 30 years. And now because of me, there is a new word calling, they say, Amadou Sidibe is uh, an archie farmer. Actually, it's for architecture. Pharma is because today I'm a leader in Mali in the uh, greenhouse technology and the production of uh, uh, all kind of crop, let's say tomatoes, concumber under greenhouse in the highest uh, technology possible. But today I will not speak long about that. I will speak about the problem we have in Mali. Mali is in Sahel. We have the Sahara Desert in a uh, two-third of the, the territory in Mali, and we have a big problem of water. Water is very scarce in, in, in our region. We have a lot of drought, and as a farmer, educated farmer, our challenge is to, to help the farmer who are living out of agriculture. In Mali, let's say we have 80% of the population who is doing agriculture and the agriculture depend on 98% of the rainfall. Rainfall that doesn't exist. Some place you have, let's say just 100 millimeter per year. Imagine you have to do agriculture in such condition. What can we do? Show them that with the, the, the small water they have, that they have to feed themselves. Imagine that in Africa today, um, the population is growing very fast and we have to feed those population. So we have to do a strategy to help the African farmer to enhance the water management practice and promote sourcing and uses. Yeah. 
You know, the water crisis in Sahel, for several decades, the Sahel has been expecting chronic climate disturbance, frequent drought and flood threaten livelihood of the population that rely mainly on agriculture and survive, to survive. So the rainfall, we don't have enough rainfall, as I was saying it before, and with the, uh, the changement of the climates, uh, the use of the water, like you say in Mali, uh, water is source of life, is also source of death, because if there is not water, if the water is pol uh, as a pollution, it can bring a lot of problems. Uh, so if you see all the, the problem we have, the scarcity of, and the consequences of this, this scarcity, I was just talking now about drop. I was talking of all the challenge, agricultural challenge we have, the life was scarcity, the climate change. And uh, we, we try to explain them with now the technology we have. L let's say if you speak about the, the drip irrigation, the drip irrigation is the, the most efficient uh, way to use the small water we have in Sahel. So the people are poor, how to help them to have drip irrigation, to show them that with drip irrigation, with less, you can do more. They are not educated. So at the first time when we were installing the drip irrigation, there was no seeing water. To them, if you don't see water, it means there is not agriculture. We have to show them that this is the best way to use the small water they have in order to get the very high production. Also, we're showing them that we can use the small water that's coming. They, they are not collecting all the water. So we, we, we explain them they can use some uh, rainwater to, to, to keep them and to use this water uh, when there is not water. Also, we explain them that using the same crop on the same land for a long time can be very complicated. It brings a lot of diseases diseases of soil. So we uh, teach we teach them how to do the diversification on the crop. And at the end, we explain them that having greenhouse, greenhouse to me has been, let's say, imagine for other people who are not inside, but the greenhouse are a, 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 an, an extraordinary tools that allow people to increase the yield, to protect the plants against all the disease, all the insects, and using, uh, like Aaron was explaining now, using all the technology of, let's say, irrigation, uh, irrigation device we have, uh, we have the computerized to the irrigation, the computerized fertigation. We have even the recycling of the water used by the plant. Because if you are in soil, as, let's say, in tomatoes, you if you give one liter of water, you will realize that the plant are maximum using 60% of this water. The 40% is going on waste. So today we are collecting those water, we disinfect them because this water is not a simply water, it's a water with uh, fertilizer. We reuse it a second time. So we are in this case in the maximum possibility of using uh, the, the, the water. So the greenhouse, allows to increase the, 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 the yield, like I said now. We even last year installed the, the, the pad cooling system. Pad cooling is very amazing when the climate is dry, like in Sahel, because pad, pad cooling is a system, Aaron was just explaining it, he has in UA, but in Mali, if you install pad cooling, you will imagine the, 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 the climate is very dry. The dry air is passing through a wet pond and you can, reduce the temperature from let's say uh, uh, 35 degree to, to 24 and the humidity inside the greenhouse is controlled uh, even yesterday I, I had a harvest of tomatoes i have one fruit of tomatoes that weigh more than 600 grams it's never seen in mali actually i'm producing bell pepper all color pep of bell pepper yellow one red one uh, green one uh, high quality but it's like I'm in a desert, I'm alone doing it. People are very poor. Our challenge as a farmer is to meet the two world. The two world uh, about Aaron was uh, speaking just now, Vietnam, UA, Australia. 
There is an, another war who is in Sahel, where people are very poor. There is not water at all. The population is growing. We have to feed those population. Imagine is 2050, uh, the, the one fourth of the world population will be African. It means Africa will have about 2.5 billion population. No water. The climate is changing. What do we have to do to feed those population? If you don't do it, if you fail to do it, it's a like a like kind of, of, of retarding bomb that can, can explode anytime. So coming to that, uh, the other use strategy we have is the community water management. Because from long time ago, uh, long, community was facing how to how to uh, 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 how to manage the small water we have so that one guy will not collect all the water the other people cannot have it so in the community 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 has the, have their own rule that is based on how to share the small water among everybody today is my talk today I, I can have let's say 100 liter tomorrow is your own next one is there somebody uh, else one so uh, those rules, we still have to improve them. We still have to apply them so that the community will live in peace with the small water they have, the youth, so that they will use it for themselves, for the community, and for everybody. Also, the government support. Okay, now, now you can see the community uh, water management I was talking about is the community water management involved the local communities working together to sustainable manage of the use of water resources within the area through decision making, implement practices, and maintaining the infrastructure and equitable access for to save water for various needs. That is very important in science. The support of government, the government support in water. Scarcity strategy involved developing policies, allocation fund, and providing capacity building to address water challenges. This includes investing in infrastructure, promoting conservation, raising awareness, and fostering collaboration among uh, stakeholders. Uh, about the greenhouses, I, I think that Aaron said enough. I, I, I will not repeat. But I want everybody to understand that the the, the way uh, Aaron is doing is uh, is uh, in uh, uh, UA, in a Arabian Union, let's say, huh? and the way because there in Arabian Union there is a lot of people doing greenhouses, so it's not something it's something very common. But somebody like me, and planting greenhouses, and planting uh, pot cooling. And planting, let's say, computerized irrigation. Nobody is there day and night. The computer is working by itself. When I'm a, a kind of, let's say, extraterrestrial, you know, when people come and visit my farm, seeing what I'm doing, they will understand that there is a long way, a very long way for them to reach that. We, as an educated farmer, has to have to help them to reach that point, saying that this is your goal. Your goal will be one day doing uh, vegetable under greenhouse in the highest technology possible, using solar energy in order to, to feed other African, you know? So that's why our work in uh, Global Farmer Networks is something very amazing. So it's helped me today. I forgot what is architecture. It doesn't interest me at all. What interested me is how to bring the, the, the best and the more, most efficient technology in agriculture in order to, to feed the population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amadou. And now we have a few minutes for q and I'm going to introduce my colleague, Ruramiso, and bring back Aaron to the stage. Thank you for being here. And please, please post, post your questions in the chat. Ramiso, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gina. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Ramiso. I am the Africa lead for the Global Pharma Network. Um, today, I'll be facilitating the question and answer session. So please feel free to ask um, as many questions as you like in the chat. Um, today is your day for us to listen and we will answer. 
Thank you so much, Aaron and Amaduo. I was really amazed at just listening to you, especially coming from Zimbabwe, where we've been experiencing severe drought. But I can see that uh, where you are, um, the amount of rainfall that you're receiving is, is by far less than what we are rece receiving in this drought. So um, Aaron, um, what is the difference from farming in Australia to moving to the UAE? What did you find um, challenging and how did you manage to start? Yeah, I think it's almost uh, complete opposite ends of the, the agricultural spectrum. When you talk about Australia, consider Australia to be one of the leading agricultural countries in the world, um, particular like in, in all areas really, um, and very different climates throughout Australia, um, depending on which part of the country you're in. Um, very heavily prominent, you know, in broad acre cropping and things like that. But whereas in the UAE culture, other than potentially like some um, potentially like goat herding, some camels like that is not not particularly common. Um, they're more used to maybe living off the the ocean, sea. Uh, very well known for being pearl divers uh, before uh, discovering oil. So it's very a young industry. Um, up until recently, the government hasn't really had too much intervention in the, the industry here, but they're actually starting to get very heavily invested, um, starting to create free zones, starting to invest in agriculture. Um, a lot of the large farms and companies that are grown, growing within the industry are, you know, uh, government driven or government owned. Um, so th there's definitely investment and a lot of urgency. Uh, I mentioned, you know, we recently had COP28 here in Dubai. Um, there was a lot of focus about sustainability, uh, part of which revolves around agriculture. Uh, but there's still a lot of challenges to overcome. You know, there's no arable land. There's limited access to water and most of it's desalinated. There is um, very challenging the summers where it reaches 50 degrees. So, um, yeah, just trying to find innovation, innovative and also like Sometimes you know, it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's just trying to, you know, incorporate these, some of the like, things like hydroponics and greenhouses have been around for a long time. Um, and there are very cost effective ways to implement that here. Um, and then it's about doing that, doing that well and, you know, educating people that we can actually grow a product in the UAE as well. So making, creating a market for it as well. So, you know, if you see a product comes from the UAE, that you decide to purchase that rather than purchase it from a, the, an overseas country. There's still a big perception here that food can't be grown in this region. So um, even for local consumers, that's that still needs some time. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's all about perception and sometimes the perception is wrong. So we have people like you to really tell the true story of farming in very difficult places like the UAE, that it is possible. Um, so there are some people who think that you need soil to be able to produce food. They don't believe that you can produce with water. What would you say to that myth? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing it for a, a long time. The last five years, I uh, exclusively haven't grown a single product in soil. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, it definitely takes a little bit of, to get your head around that it can be done in different ways. Uh, there is a bit of a perception that you know it might be considered like artificial or what's the end flavor uh, like taste profile or anything at the end um because obviously that's going to be important if it doesn't taste good the end product then people aren't gonna aren't gonna purchase it um but yeah it's, it's a lot about sort of it you know creating the perfect environment for that product to grow as it would in the perfect setting whether it may be in parts of europe whether it's in australia you know we don't have those conditions necessarily um an outdoor environment here in the UAE, but we can try and replicate them or get as close to um, as possible, whether that's using liquid nutrients, um, using substrates as a, the medium to actually grow the product in. Um, it, it tends to be very effective here in this region, whether that be you might be using rock wool slabs to grow your tomato crops or cocoa peat in, in Vietnam. We used recycled coconut husk just because it was so readily available. Um, yeah, there's really endless opportunities there, and a lot of them are proving to be more and more efficient as well. Definitely. Well, you're achieving um, three times each day of leafy greens. That's a lot of um, productivity. So you're definitely doing something correct. 
So Amadou, what made you move from engineering to farming? That's a very interesting, um, you know, um, change in career. Um, what was your what was your motivator for the change? It's uh, me, my grandfather. My grandfather was a farmer. My father was uh, working in the administration, but he still had a farm. We were born. My father had a farm. And as I told you, I'm an architect. I've been practicing architecture, and uh, I can explain. I have traveled a lot uh, because of my profession. I went to uh, visit China, Japan, Israel, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, and I saw that they were doing farming under greenhouses, and also they were doing grape. grape. And to me, I was. I said. If greenhouse is in those country, of for sure it will work in Mali. So in 2012, I purchased my first greenhouse of 320 square meter from Israel, and then we started it. After six months, I realized that uh, there will not be better tools for Africa than greenhouses. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the region of Africa where the rainfall is not much. And because uh, greenhouse allow you to do a lot of thing, it allow you to protect your plants. It allow you to use the water and the, uh, the, the fertilizer who are very costly in Africa uh, in the best way in the more. And to answer to your question, I don't know how. Maybe I had the virus of agriculture when I was born. It's my in my NDA maybe, but today. As I told you, I did the monument of independence of Mali. It's one of the best and the, the most famous building in Mali. I did a lot of building for university. But in my head today, I'm thinking I lost my time. The time I spend on doing agriculture in architecture, I should I do agriculture a long time because I think to show to people. I, I when I grow my crop, I give to somebody to test. When they say, "Oh, Amadou is so tasty," Amadou is so interesting. I'm more known as a farmer than an architect. Can you imagine? Because the potential of agriculture in Africa is so huge. So less thing is done that is allowed to somebody like me, not being an agronomist, but to perform in ag agriculture. Maybe that is the answer of your question. Thank you, Amadou. And by the way, your English is perfect. So. Um yeah you really explained it well we definitely need a lot of innovation in africa especially with um in terms of water and how to use it efficiently and you are definitely a role model so when you started amadou what initial challenges um did you incur because there are some people who want to start but they're wondering what sort of challenges um, did you incur to start off with and what then opportunities did you see and how did you tackle the the challenges okay like uh, all the pioneers because nobody known what was greenhouse before in Mali. I bought the greenhouse. They say, well, what is this guy? Maybe he's an architect. He has a lot of money. He's trying to show that after building houses, you can build a structure and doing architecture inside. But I did it. The first challenge was how to get people to help me to install the house. Because you buy a greenhouse from Israel to get somebody coming from Israel to install the greenhouse in Mali it will be very difficult one they will say no no safety there and today is a small business so to get people to help you to do but i'm an engineer my profession of uh, architect helped me to get people and to build it the second challenge is to get somebody that will help you to to conduct the plants to manage the plant to do the seedling to do the irrigation to do the fertigation not being an agronomist and the most difficult challenge is the financing, how to get money to involve into agriculture. Because for us, agriculture is a risk, a big risk. The risk of, let's say, disease, the risk of climate, the, the, the risk of maybe you can do something, it will not be good. So the financing is one of the key points of you know, promoting agriculture in Africa. If you go to uh, to to bank, commercial bank, they don't know how to work because once I borrow a loan from a bank, saying that okay, within three years I will pay. But to, I didn't know myself how it was working. That I could get money because they trusted me. They gave me the money. 
Now, when we, I start the reimbursing of the money back, we had a big problem because for the bank, every month you have, can pay the same amount. Let's say every month you pay 10,000. But they, they didn't imagine, like me, that you have to take a seed. The seed cannot give a fruit in two days. You have to wait three months. You'll have the first fruit. You'll, you'll imagine that the, the harvest will go small, small to get the targets. And after a while, the target will drop down. You don't have money to pay. So for the bank, I would have the same income every year. So together we face that problem and to understand that the, 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 the funding of agriculture is something quite different. It has to be linked to the production. When there is no production, the bank should tell you to pay something because you can pay. So mm -hmm. that was a key challenge I had coming into this. And during 10 years, I was struggling to do. Today, I know the A, B, Z of how to do, how to do a project, who to invite you to help, how to do it, how to sell it. Now I'm working like a consultant in Africa, in Chad, in, in Burkina Faso, and to, to learn them, you know, how to start a new business. And my first point, I said, don't go to commercial bank to take money. No way. Try to start with your own fund. Go step by step, right step by step, and you can you will come at the level of, of Amadou. Because for, for them, Amadou is a level everybody has to see. But to me, I am working to enable more people to do more than what I did because I did a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes I'm using now to do, let's say, uh, uh, game change projects. Thank you. Thank you, Amadou. And you definitely are a role model for uh, many people who think it's not possible. And you're already leading um, an example in many places. And I'm sure you're going to do more and even people listening here. And I agree with you. We need innovative banking in agriculture. It's something that maybe one day we'll have a webinar where we talk to some um, some bankers and see what sort of models can we implement to bring innovative um, support uh, um, finance to support farmers. So thank you. So um, we have um, a farmer who is asking um, about what, because Amadou, this is for both you, Amadou and Aaron. Um, so I know, Amadou, you mentioned that you're working with government. Um, so they're asking, what recommendation do you have for building national and regional water strategies for storing water? Um, this can be for large scale and at farm level. Okay, the strategy of to manage the small water or we are using, because if you take water generally, human being, 70% of the water available for human being are going to agriculture. 18% is going for human use, uh, uh, municipalities. 12% is going to, to, let's say, the industry, to the industry. So the part of agriculture in water is huge. So if you are in a country like Mali, the small water you have, we don't have to waste it. To not waste it, you have to use it efficiently. Today, we know in agriculture, the most efficient way to use the water is drip irrigation. What the government have to do to able people to have their own green, they have their own, uh, let's say, drip irrigation system. If that is possible, that can be possible only through subsidiary subsidies, you know, the subvention, government have to do subvention on all the material regarding irrigation. Uh, the other way, look at uh, the rainfall in Mali. If you go to the south of Mali, you have three more rainfall. You can get 1,200 millimeters. But if you go to the north, you don't have 100, 150. So what to do to keep those water coming they're coming in a short time but we won't be needed all the time so we have to be able to 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 govern to be able to keep the kind they call dump in order to the lake you know to store the water to be able to use it afterwards so the policy policy of using water the government have to be involved inside to help the community to educate them to to show them how to use it and to be there like uh uh, a judge that's going to tell them um okay um amadou just froze um oh continue amadou 
Oh, no. Thank you so yeah. much for so your... The, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I love... You listen to me? Yes, yes, Hello. we can hear you clearly. We lose the connection or what? No, we can hear you. That's fine. Um, thank you so much, Amadou, for that. Um, definitely, we need to have to be engaged in government to create policies like what I said, like what you said, Aaron, in um, in Australia, that even the amount of time you shower is um, is controlled. So I think those are some of the discussions that are very important for us to start having, so that we make sure that the water is going to the most important places, which is for us to be able to farm to produce food. As the population keeps on growing, we need to produce food. Um, Aaron, I have a bit of a technical question that um, someone asked. Um, their question was, what are the water requirements for tomatoes and capsicum, capsicum in, um, in hydroponics where um, rice husks and cocoa um, peck as the growing medium? So I don't know if that is if a question that you can Yeah, it's, it's quite technical. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I sort of commented in the, the other chat, but, you know, the water can... can it, it varies, you know, very drastically uh, because of a lot of factors. So obviously the one mentioned there in terms of the growing medium is going to be key. Um, we use a product called Zero Light, also tested cocoa peat in different um, uh, mixes as well. And, you know, one of the key things that I would stress on is that always be looking to test and, you know, collecting that data and analyzing so that you can make the best decisions for the next season. So. For instance, we'll be reviewing um, a product like different, maybe three or four different products in the various greenhouses moving forward, uh, whether that's different substrates, different structures within the farm, using different gutters or systems to elevate the product off the ground, um, different forms of greenhouses, different shading systems. So it, it's really not about necessarily having, you know, a set target of this much um, leaders per, per per grow room per day it's it's always looking to sort of refine and improve that season on season whether that be consumption or also on the yield end of things as well um and we do that across everything so substrate seed varieties we'll be testing a number of different seed varieties um, and just yeah always looking at ways that we can improve thank you for that, that Aaron. Is yeah, thank you for that. Um, I hope that will be very useful um, for our farmer. Um, so also, um, there's so many questions that are coming um, around the that, that we see hydroponics is very water efficient, but it demands a lot of energy and it's high cost. Um, what are you doing in terms of, um, um, in, in the UAE, are there any challenges of energy and do you need backup power or Amadou, maybe you can also jump in after to say what, what are you doing to um, for the energy demands for um, the technology and um, and are there ways to, for someone who wants to start maybe on a small scale, how do they manage the costs? Do you, because we saw a lot of technology that you showed, do you, um, you know, the cost of having all that technology at once might be expensive. Are there certain stages that you took when you were starting um, your your hydroponic project? Yeah, so two projects I've worked on in the UAE are probably both opposite ends of the, the scale. So when we look at the, the large scale indoor vertical farm, energy is the major consumption. Obviously, the water sustainability element is there and the food production, food security, but the biggest demand in terms of cost and uh, in terms of stability is, is definitely energy because um, you've got all the LED grow lights, the HVAC systems, all of that, the pumps, etc. Um, so it is a challenge here um, in terms of energy. It's something that's developing. Currently, it's not really possible for you to transfer energy from site to site in the UAE. So if you were to have a large scale farm like what we had at Pustanica, um, you would probably ideally like to partner that with some sort of renewable energy project. Um, and I think that what other countries, uh, Western countries will look to do when uh, scaling other large indoor vertical farms, for instance, uh, whether that be solar or other areas. As for the, the farm I'm with now, we currently base in an area called Alain, so it's technically part of Abu Dhabi, and uh, we're actually uh, subsidized with electricity. So they, they're actually very good in that respect in terms of the cost for energy and, and water. Um, especially for small-scale farmers. So they do 
definitely help in, in that respect, allowing you to, to sort of, in, in terms of the entry, um, the cost of entry growing. Once you start to scale up your business, the, 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 the issue becomes the actual uh, increasing load on your site becomes a challenge. That's something that we're going through currently. We, we look to actually quadruple our greenhouse operations this year. So the challenge isn't so much necessarily the cost of energy, but actually allowing the energy that we physically need on site. So we're, based on that, we'll start to look at innovative approaches. So for instance, I, I posted recently in the Global Pharma Network, there's a company that's reached out to me about a complete off-grid cold storage system. Um, and that's something we're interested in. One, because we don't currently have a cold storage to we don't currently have any load for a cold storage system uh, the ability to look at you know um, sustainable ways to to have off-grid energy would be really useful for us um, even if it is on a smaller scale like a single cold room um, but yeah working okay progress. my side i'm helping uh, the the new farmer because today, today doing farming is a mod. Everybody wants to do farming. But they don't want to lose money. I'm helping them with my experience, 10, 12 years experience of losing money, of doing mistakes to avoid them doing the same mistake like me. Uh, young people that one were the doctor, some are engineers, some are, let's say, everybody wants to do farming because the demand of good crop is very high. The kilo of tomatoes now in Bamako is $1.5, $2. I'm talking about tomatoes from greenhouses. So I'm helping them to purchase because I know, know worldwide, worldwide the, the good produce of greenhouses. Today, the Indian markets offer to African very good, cheap greenhouses. Because if you want to go to buy it in Israel, it will be costly because, you know, sometimes you don't need to buy a Mercedes. You just buy a, a good Toyota. It's make your, your business in Africa. So I help them to get the cheapest and the most efficient uh, greenhouses. And I train them. I help them also to, to, to sell the production outside. It's a kind of, let's say, uh, how do you call it? Uh, um, I'm forgetting this English. So I'm, I'm giving a standard. I bring the seeds, the best seed possible. I'm working with the, the major uh, optical seed producer, like let's say Syngenta, Close, and Zazaden. And I'm struggling with those companies to get the best seed possible for our market. With the fertilizer market also, Vani, Peren, the other IFA industry, I struggle to get the best chemical for them. Sometimes I even give to the new farmer, which has, they have the land, they have the water, I give them the facility to produce and to pay me back. So doing that today, look at before, sweet melon, we're importing new sweet melon from Morocco, from Senegal. Today, nobody's importing any more sweet melon. Same thing for watermelon. Today, we have our national production that is sufficient for, for let's say, for us. Tomatoes is the same thing coming. Before, we were not producing bell pepper. Today, we are producing high-quality bell pepper for local markets. It's what we are trying to achieve. And uh, we are on a good way, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amadou. Um, and thank you very much, um, Aaron. Wow, we were very inspired to learn so much about water efficiency. I'm encouraged, even with our 366 millimeter that we received this year, that you know it's actually not as bad. We hear from um, Aaron and Amadou who really shared on how they are producing tons and tons every day with the little water they have. So thank you so much um, for sharing your experiences with us. We, um, we're so grateful to have um, such experts coming here and, and um, spending an hour with us and sharing with other farmers and um, other people wanting to go into agriculture here on how um, the technologies that you're using and the importance of technologies in agriculture especially when we're faced with climate change. So thank you so much. And to um, everyone of viewers today, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have a part two on water efficiency happening on the 28th of March. So register early and um, set reminders because it's going to be, we're continuing with this conversation and um, so much to discuss. Um, keep your questions coming in and we're happy to answer them. Um, follow our social media handles if you haven't, um, our LinkedIn, 
uh, Facebook, um, we're also on YouTube. Just look for Global Pharma Network and that's us. And then you can also continue posting um, your comments there and we can happily um, answer them. So thank you so much for your attention and everyone have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.